at what age did you discover you had a passion for strength and conditioning? I was, wasn't so much a passion early on. I was always interested in sport. I had a um, probably a moderately successful junior athletics career. Um, I was a long jumper, high jump for a little bit as well, um, 100 meter runner. Um, so I liked all the short, fast stuff. And um, I was coached, uh, funnily enough, as, by a junior as Bowden, by Bowden Babichek, who um, you had on a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, he's a good friend of mine. He coached me for about 10 or 11 years. And um, being one of the, probably one of the pioneering um, strength and conditioning coaches in the AFL at the time, he sort of brought the, a little bit more of the track and field type flavor to, to AFL, along with John Quinn as well, who you've had on. Um, they brought that type of um, track and field type approach and that type of conditioning into the AFL. And, um, you know, being exposed to that type of thing for such a very long time um, when it came down to my own training as well, I found I had a little bit of a knack to, to teach it and understand the positions and understand what it should feel like for, for people and actually be able to um, translate that in a way that made people improve a little bit quicker. And uh, you had a long, successful career. What was one of your favourite ways to um, continually self-develop your, your knowledge and your and your practical skills? Oh, I think just just talking to people all the time. Don't don't get insular with the things you do. You can get, um, you know, when you're under pressure, you can get stuck inside your own head pretty quickly and uh, internalise too much. But just keep talking to people because, um, you know, I had a department of seven or eight people, and all of them had great ideas and um, solid opinions as well. And those opinions. Um, like formed the way we operated within the group and th- like being able to um, to talk to people and bounce ideas off every single person that you work with is really important just to keep morale up as well. Um, you know, Carlton didn't win a lot of games, but if you came into, you know, our department, like we still bounced in there every Monday like, like we'd won because we had to too because we've got 45 players out there that need to um, regroup and back up and try and win the next week, you know. You've worked with a lot of the, uh, you know, the high level caliber athletes and being a, uh, an athlete yourself what, what do you think is some strong traits for developing footballers to to um, get in the habit of doing it at a young age oh, I, th- well, I think clearly like if you're going to get good at anything you've got to be consistent with how you train um yeah. training for speed and getting your mechanics um tidy um is a really important one um if all footballers are going to get fit no matter where they started a football club they're going to get fitter no question um, not burning yourself out before you even get to that stage is really important. So um, once again, learning all the speed, um, having a schedule that allows you to do things with really good quality. You've got to work hard, no question, but have a schedule that allows you to get the results you need. So right. but let's not um, try and do, you know, a you know, 10K intermittent running session and then do high-speed stuff at the end of it because it's yep. really risky. Um, and on top of that, let's not go into the gym and try and do, you know, really fast, you know, explosive weights the next morning or something like that. These little things and the recovery time within that is really important. Uh, my season's been cancelled and I have two or three runs before pre-season starts. Any advice on how to structure my training plan? I'd be probably looking more at structuring my week. If you're going to run three times, doing one speed type session, uh, one interval type session, and then one sort of fart like aerobic type session, it doesn't have to be crazy in terms of volume. Um, yep. But just making sure you can do all those things with good quality is really important now. Like you don't have to finish all those sessions like feeling like you're just going a 10 out of 10. Um, yep. I'd be taking it to the stage where the next day you feel like, yeah, I could do that again, but I'm not going to. But, you know, sticking to a structure that's allowing you to hit all of those components as, as best you can without burning yourself is really important. Yep. And you mentioned that before, didn't you? The consistency over time. So. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, like you don't have to do anything miraculous. It's just making sure it's being done and being done really well yep. um, is probably the priority, yeah. Next one, um, who was your favourite athlete to work with and why? Um, there's, been, oh, there's been quite a few. Like, uh, you know, when you're talking 20 years, you're talking probably 1,000-odd players. Or yeah. about, oh, not quite a 1,000, probably 500-odd players is quite a lot. But um, oh, if I work my way backwards, probably like Ed Kerno is – and everyone's probably heard this before, like Ed Kono's ability to run and that type of thing, but Ed's um, not like every other egg. He's, um, he's a bit of a different unit and his, his combination of speed, um, speed endurance and endurance is like nothing I've ever seen. Like he is the best runner I've ever seen as a combined runner. Yeah. Um, from a speed perspective, um, Dylan Buckley was ridiculously fast. 
ridiculously yeah. skinny, really, really skinny and really fast. Uh, in your work life, what makes you angry? What are your what are your pet peeves? Oh, just not just lack of organisation, not planning enough. Yeah, you know when you come from a <laughs> from a daily work life where it's um, every minute's scrutinised. You know, I think it's I like being very lazy on weekends when I can be and all that type of stuff. But if it's things around work and trying to get something done and do it positively, not being organised annoys me a little bit. Uh, favorite way to spend your day off? Oh, I've got two kids. They keep me occupied on my day off. My son's just learned how to get off. He's just off his training wheels, so on his bike. So, yeah, it was a little milestone. So he's pretty happy with it. Massive one. Awesome. Take us through how to, how, what a strength and conditioning coach does in, in high school. Well, to, to be perfectly honest, it's exactly the same as what happens at professional level. It's just on a the, you just got a different clientele, basically. Um, yep. you just got to, you just got to tone everything down. And, um, to be honest, it's probably, um, in terms of setting up a foundation, it's probably a better way of doing it than when your athletes are at professional level because you can actually start from the bottom and have a really big effect really quickly. Um, because these young kids haven't had a lot of exposure to any of the lifting, any of the techniques, anything like they get excited daily, weekly about the things that happen. So, um, yeah, that's good. Like, and the other one too is like bringing energy, like working with young kids that want to be in there, mate, it just keeps you energized anyway. But, um, like, our, our program at Simonica's focuses a lot on um, just making sure that foundation's solid. So from a lifting, lifting point of view, all the basics. Um, from a running mechanics point of view, all the basics. Um, and we're lucky enough to have um, a few full-time um, professional coaches on board that work at the school. Um, and they do technical work with our basketball program, soccer program, AFL program, uh, and track and field program as well. So along with a bunch of uh, uh, casual coaches that come in as well, they do a great job.